about uh, reactive extensions in our SGS. Yeah. Yeah. All right, who went to code match? Everybody's back, code match, and no, I saw a couple of you. What was some of the best things you saw at code match? Some of your best tracks? I learned about HTTP2. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, that was a good one. I was in that one. Hero, what did you like? Gee, it's hard to say. A lot of stuff was awesome. But um, conference about people sharing their own experiences on their workplace was the best thing because you end up putting together more experience on your back too and learning yeah. from the best ones too. Yeah, there was a couple good ones. There was one that was on uh, security. Pretty much the whole theme of it was capture an API request, change it, and break everybody's server. That was <laughs> actually pretty funny. Uh, but tonight, it's not going to be nowhere near that good. So just get ready. Um, like John said, my name is Jeff. I've uh, been doing the dev thing for 10 years. It's probably more like 9 or 10 or 11. I don't really know. I don't really pay attention. But just like a lot in the room, I'm not sure if I'm a good programmer or just really good at looking stuff up. So uh, I work for Renault Solutions out in Hartville. They were supposed to add a slide in, and as most dev teams happen, it didn't get here until like a minute or two ago. So. Renovo is a seven-year-old privately held company. Of course, I've been here since October, so I don't really know exactly completely what we do yet, so I'm going to cheat. Um, these provide medical equipment asset management, asset management service across the country. Our main product is called Renovo Live. It's a web application that they use that all of our techs and hospitals techs use to maintain all the equipment and track all the items throughout the hospital. Um, we're a software team, there's about 11 of us. Some days there's a little more, a little less. There's a couple consultants that show up or help when we need them. Uh, we currently are working in the Angular 1, Angular 2, and .NET stack. Um, our application's pretty big. It spans anything from our legacy application that's web forms, all the way up to some MVC, to some Angular 1, to some Angular 1 upgraded to Angular 2, and then a full Angular 2 site is our, our latest project for the, the actual service event stuff. But uh, there's a couple things later. Um, you got to look out for it. I got some gift cards from Renovo. They kind of gave me some stuff to pass out. There's a few things. I'll ask some questions. Get a couple gift cards. So tonight's RxJS. What is RxJS? I'll give you guys a couple minutes. You got to read all of that. Let me change the lights here. If you don't read all that, you won't know what I'm talking about. Hit four, Jeff. It's not even light now. Maybe. Behind you on the wall, there's controls hitting for <laughs> There we go. So I'm lying to read all that. Um, so RxJS is Reactive Extensions, which isn't really specifically RxJS. RxJS is JavaScript, and TypeScript is what we use it in. Um, but that's kind of what our demos are focused on. Uh, but it's all kind of the same. Uh, reactive Extensions is a pattern, more or less, that allows developers to support sequence of data and events while abstracting away several complexities. Um, it's kind of this discrete values that are emitted over top of a stream over time, and you can react to those. That's kind of the whole basis of the pattern, is you request data, and then you react to the responses from that data or that stream. Um, there's several other versions of React extensions. The very first one was a Microsoft product. It was in .NET 4. Um, that was the very, very, very first one. Uh, but now there's a Java version. There's Rx Java, a C Sharp version. That's Rx.NET. Ruby is Rx RB. Swift is Rx Swift. PHP is Rx PHP. And the whole point to reading these out was to make fun of Brandon. Uh, Elixir actually has a React and extensions and it's called Reactive. It doesn't match anything else that anybody else did. There's none other that are named weird like that except for Elixir. <laughs> I was hoping that Brandon would have some insight on that, but apparently he's in trouble, so he's got his own stuff to deal with. He'll get to watch the video later. Yeah, 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 thanks. <laughs> so this seems pretty cool. We did React to data. It seems like a new way. Angular 2 uses it. Let's go ahead and use observables for everything. You can. Why not, right? Well, through us working with it, I found that there's some things you really just need to be careful of. You shouldn't just pass observables around and make everything into observables. 
Uh, they're pretty easy to lose track of who or what is listening or what is emitting data over that stream. Several things can observe that observable, and sometimes it's not even actually observable. You can have different objects that will disguise themselves as observables, and it's really easy to lose track of what's triggering responses inside of the observable and what is not. Uh, same goes for hot and cold observables. I'll touch on that in a minute. Uh, you've got to really pay attention to what is hot and what is cold, what will complete, what will not complete. Um, it can create an architectural mess. If you're passing observables all over the place, it's really easy to either you know, make calls you don't want to make or lose track of what calls have already been made or especially what order calls are made in uh, when you're pulling down actual objects from your database and from your APIs or everything. In observables is a sync, async. It's really hard to synchronize these streams. And it's really tough. It, it's not quite as much like promises. It's not as fluid. So you got to be really careful. Everything is async, and you have to go from the mindset of reacting what happens when the stream gets something. But that's all right. Just like anything else, um, think twice, code once. Um, there's a few key things that I try to do. Uh, I try not to pass observables when they're not necessary. It's often fun to have a modal pop up that only loads the data when it starts to present itself to save server load. That's cool, that's a really good option for this. But if you've got pieces below or subcomponents inside of a component that are going to need that data anyways, don't pass observables around and let everything subscribe to it. Uh, you can get out of hand, you can make extra server calls that you don't need. So let your structural frameworks change detection anyway. You know, Angular 2's change detection is fairly decent as long as it's you keep the immutable objects, it does pretty well. Let it go ahead and handle that instead of trying to track your own observables through everything. Uh, pay close attention to which streams will complete and which will not. If you don't do this, next thing you know, you're in an Angular 2 application that won't load because you have a hot observable as your guard unintentionally and you break production build and you spend a day trying to figure out what you did. Um, place extra caution when architecting when and where these observables are emitted to and what is subscribed to, especially with post and put. It's very easy to attach an observable to you know, a put or a post and then actually fire it over and over again unintentionally based on the way the page is loading, page is loading or what you're clicking. And don't always expect the data to be there. Uh, again, just remember to react. It's, it's a whole responsive thing. You need to react to the data in the stream, not expect that observable to actually be data. So the basics. What is an observable? Uh, an observable is a simple stream of asynchronous data. This little line guy will be referenced a lot. Uh, each one of those dots are events or data or any kind of emission over top of the stream. Uh, it implements a subset of methods, the onNext, onAir, and onComplete. We'll kind of talk about that a little bit on the next slide. Um, there are two types of observables, a hot and a cold. The easiest way to describe the difference between a hot and a cold is a hot observable is a lot like a Facebook Live feed. Um, you always come mid-sentence, halfway through, you don't really know what's going on. You watch it for as long as you want, and then when you've had enough, you go ahead and close it. Uh, a hot observable, you might see the end. It's very unlikely that you'll see the beginning, um, but it's not guaranteed that you're going to get the entire piece of the actual emission of data. A cold observable um, actually doesn't do anything. It's pretty lazy. It waits until a subscriber is online and subscribing, and each subscriber has the availability, depending on what kind of subject is being used to get either the last emission or a list of all of the emissions, or in case of errors, the errors. Uh, observables are kind of the basics that everything's built on, uh, whether we're going to get into subjects or other things. They all have observables as their bases, so a subject can often be just hidden as an observable. Alright, so to begin to observe items, you do what's called subscribe to the actual observable. That starts the stream, starts you listening to what's going on. You also, inside of there, define what is going to happen when you subscribe and you get an emission, what is going to happen when you error, and what has happened when you complete. Those are the three hooks that were on the last page. Um, you often need to use one or more operators to consume the screen. 
consume the stream. Those are inside of RxJS, um, like the uh, map. Anybody that's done a, 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 a Angular 2 data call has seen map, because you usually have to take the data and map to some kind of JSON object. Um, but there's a map switch map, which switches out what observable is coming back. There's some debouncing tools. There's a bunch of other tools. It's a whole library of operators, which is really the real power of RxJS. Um, and an observer can an observer can unsubscribe from an observable at any time. Observers possess a setup and a teardown to them when using an actual observable. So you can subscribe to it, begin your stream, and then you can actually unsubscribe from that observable. And the observable knows how to tear itself down and complete itself. So let's go ahead and get a demo with those two. Trying to go fast, got a lot of slides. Anybody have any questions yet? Great. It's kind of small, can everybody see? No, we stop with it. Control plus. Jeff, old age is setting in back here. <laughs> of course, the computer's going to act like that. I love Visual Studio Code until you try to do something inside of it. That Chrome isn't happy about. And that most often means your scroll bars. So we have just a basic component here. Um, it makes an API call that I have set up. Uh, the get all names no cache is just going to go ahead and return an observable of an API call. And you'll see this dot names equals names. That's just going to go ahead and take whatever data is coming back from that API call and go ahead and put it in my string array. Uh, I've got some console logs there for any kind of errors that were happened would show up in the console log. And then also one to let us know when it's completed. And then in here is the actual Angular uh, 2 HTTP engines call. Just pass it a base URL. And then there's that map operator I was talking about. Uh, this actually takes the Angular 2 response type and maps it through a JSON processor so you actually get your data back as an object. We'll go ahead and let it run. So whenever I loaded the page, Let's go ahead and start making the call. 